Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, including the stuff from Silver Tempest, make sure you check out the Potown store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code OmniPoke. For today's video, myself and Jack are on Trainer Hill, and we're going to be doing a tier list. They make it very easy for us uh, to just uh, take the archetypes that we want to talk about and bung them straight into a tier list maker. Very, very easily done. You can see it's all here. You can select the decks you want to. And this is going to be in mind for the LAIC and the regionals immediately following that. Uh, we've had uh, just over a week of tournaments, really, like 10 days or so, uh, of online data to look at. And we've had a play with a number of the decks ourselves. So we're going to go over what we think are some of the best decks in the game and uh, where they are going to be placed in our tier list. So, Jack, do you want to kick us off with uh, with something? Yeah, um, let's start with... Uh, let's start with Mew Genesect, because that's a deck that we've both uh, played this season mm. and has been around for uh, a, year, a year now. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's still going to be solidly in that A tier. We actually think it's uh, still really, really good. It's um, kind of shifted away from the DTE uh, kind of style it was before. And it's gone back to a bit more of a Meloetta, more aggressive approach. Um, I think this is naturally just because the format, um, when Lugia gets going, it is a pretty quick deck and the format has slightly sped up. Um, so I think the speed of being able to take a turn two or a turn one knockout going second with the Meloetta um, can actually just put you so far ahead in the game. It's really interesting that uh, DTEMU genuinely felt like almost the best deck in the game when it got to go first. Um, but it really felt like it was on the back foot when it got when it was going second, uh, and that, because of that, the format just moved away from being able to do that kind of thing. Um, the fusion build was always able to at least have uh, an argument going second as well, trying to take a KO um, with uh, with the uh, Meloetta. So I think uh, that's exactly why uh, we've started to move back to that fusion build. There's um, still a fair few two prize decks that you can really punish, including Lugia. Um, those Archaeopters are only. Uh, one prizes from turn two when they're cheated onto the board so there's still plenty of targets for you to be uh, picking up um, and i think that's why this deck has been seeing uh, a lot of success as as always um, and we've moved back to uh, the fusion build i still think it's really really strong it's uh definitely um always has been one of the most aggressive decks in the format and nothing really changes um you're still a vmax deck which definitely also has merits i think you're a little bit worried about drapions as always um but realistically with some one prizes. Um, yes, it's a bit worrying, but you do have a little bit of uh, sort of maneuverability. Um, you can sort of maybe try and bait out the, the uh, two prizes or the, the, the Drapions and stuff like that with uh, Muse early and then try and revenge KO them with one prize and try and close out the game with the Meloettas. Um, so there's definitely ways around it. And I think probably more ways around it realistically than just sort of Roxanne plus Path and trying to hope that they don't find a way back into the Drapion or have another answer. So um, I think there's, you, it's just a, you have to approach uh, a Drapion slightly differently with um, the fusion build. But um, so you're always going to be a little bit nervous of it. I think lost boxes um, with a Drapion still sound like a massive headache. Um, but other than that, I think the matchup's run is still fairly good. I think Giratina um, was always a bit shaky uh, for the DTE build, but having a little bit more aggression uh, can be really nice uh, against Giratinas as well. Um, yes, again, they can still uh, use that Drapion line if they want to, but uh, being a much more aggressive deck um, will just increase the pace of play, reduce the amount of turns they have to do all of their Lost Zone stuff. Same with Lost Box, realistically. At least putting some pressure on is always going to be good. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's it's still really, really solid. I think there's still plenty of people that could just very easily tech in a Drapion, even into decks that doesn't necessarily make sense to play it in, and you could end up having a bit of a bad day. But realistically, it's still got the best draw engine in the game. Um, and with this more, or going back to this more aggressive build, I actually think you can compete with a lot of these top decks um, like you once could. So yeah, I think uh, we're both sort of back on the fusion build, or at least reconsidering the fusion build uh, much more than the DTE DT build right now, just because you need the aggression rather than sort of the flexibility. There was also a really interesting build one uh, that Azul won a tournament with that was like a uh, real disruption build. It was really leaning into that DT package and just going full uh, full Marnie, full path, um, and really trying to uh, brick people. So it's, it'll be really interesting to see how that develops, whether that is the way of playing the DT build these days, um, and whether that sort of uh, makes up for the loss of Meloetta. Now you just have to basically become a new Marnie path deck and just try and lock <laughs> people out of the game. Um, which, to be honest, when you're Marnie pathing, but then also... 
able to loss remover and have the best draw engine in the game, it's actually pretty appealing. Um, I'm just not convinced that um, you you get into the game enough because you end up being clogged with all of these loss removers and uh, paths and monies and stuff. That's my biggest concern. So it's going to be interesting to see how that one develops. Uh, but yeah, there's still enough. Honestly, that this Mew is going to be around because of the draw engine more than anything. Um, and it just is going to be adapting between how uh, or what kind of meta it needs to be in. And right now we're in a really aggressive meta. And I think the Meloetta really serves that quite well. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I do like the, uh, the Zorro garb approach that people are trying out with Mew. <laughs> Definitely something I need to try myself. Let's talk about Tina then. It was kind of, I guess, alongside Palkia, the best deck in the previous format. And we think it claims its uh, A-tier status and continues to be that sort of deck, probably a little bit behind Mew. Uh, but like Jack said, it's got a decent time into Mew, where its strategy alongside Drapion is still pretty much intact. Um, it's reasonable into Lugia. I think we'll definitely be seeing double Temple of Sinnoh going into Giratina list going forward, I think that's more or less already uh, establishing itself as a staple so that you can uh, lost impact into Lugia's and remove that effect of the V-Guard energy and make sure that uh, you're just getting through them and racing as best you can. Um, and outside of that, it remains relatively unchanged. Uh, there's still a number of, you know, lost zone boxes and stuff that you can try and use your Sableye and Greninja against. So you're relatively, like, reasonable in that matchup. I think you lose some percentage points into Reggie's, which is a bit of a shame, mostly because they can, of course, Serena up damaged Giratinas. Oftentimes you would try and shred with your Giratinas and uh, move around the board and deny prize cards. Now they can bring those guys back and knock them out. So a bit of a stumbling block for the Giratina. And maybe also you suffer from some Greninja gate builds of Lost Box. So I think it is losing a little bit of footing, but more or less you're the same 60 as you were before. You enjoy seeing an uptick in Mew, in my opinion, and you're reasonable enough into Lugia that you're going to be just sort of this no-nonsense deck that can get through annoying walling Pokemon, you can get through pretty much anything, and you have your plan A that can still just steamroll a number of matchups, and you still have that flexibility with the Cram. I still really like Snorlax uh, and Sableye, that you can fight a one prize fight in a number of situations as well, so uh, still versatile enough, still strong enough to be an A tier deck, I think. Yeah. Uh, next up, I'm going to have a quick chat about Reggie's. Reggie's is a really interesting one, because um, I think by a lot of people's standards, realistically, it has a brilliant matchup spread. When you look at the matchup spread on paper, it feels like a lot of matchups are like 60-40, sometimes at least 60-40, maybe even better. But if you actually look at the stats, a lot of these are way closer to 50-50 just because of the inconsistencies of Reggie's. It really feels like one of these decks that you do have to draw pretty hot with, but you don't have to draw massively hot to be favoured in the matchup. And if you get into the matchup, um, especially towards the latter stages of the game when you really start to thin that deck out, um, you, it's definitely a really strong deck i think your biggest issue most of the time is just going to be yourself and your own deck trying trying not to trip over itself but um the addition of serena i think is so big for the deck it's it's uh it's basically the the perfect supporter guy for the deck it's doing everything it needs to do in terms of draw power as well as being able to now play gust which was i think um something that reggie's really was lacking to be honest so um the the deck definitely got better the matchups still have uh, a pretty wide array of 50-50s uh, actually when they're being played, even though on paper some of these are closer to 60-40s maybe. Uh, so that's the biggest thing to keep in mind. We still think it's A tier though, because um, again, you don't need to run massively hot, you just need to not run cold with it basically. And you're going to be hitting enough matchups to be able to do stuff, um, which is nice. You have weakness on a variety of different things. You're a one prize deck, but you're not a uh, one prize deck like Lost Zone Box, which can be bullied by other Sableyes and stuff. You actually are pretty chunky. Um, you know, you're you're often being able to trade up or at least forcing additional answers out of different decks. Um, and you're not really like massively caught in the crossfire of too much. I think every now and again, you'll see people teching in hit things here and there. I think the biggest or the scariest thing is probably collapsed becoming more and more important in some of these decks. Um, I think that's generally the best tech against you. Uh, I think there's a lot of merit to uh, collapse anyway in this at the moment. Um, it also helps out against things like Lost Box as well. So I think the biggest or the scariest thing in terms of techs people can play is actually Collapse rather than anything that's like super hard countering you. So you're probably gonna, are going to still need to have uh, that dedicated space to a high stadium count. But other than that, if you're wanting to sort of run the gauntlet um, of yourself and not bricking too much, I still think Reddy's is a pretty fine play. You just have to be 
uh, sort of wary of the fact that you can uh, sometimes be a little bit inconsistent here and there. And I think, but realistically, I think if you're at peace with that, it's still a pretty strong matchup board across the uh, matchup spread across the board. So uh, if that's if that's what you're happy with, um, I think it's still a really solid A tier deck. Let's talk about the elephant in the room then, the Lugia deck. It's pretty much seeming exactly as it, everyone expected. It is the strongest deck in the game. It has so much versatility in techs. You can tech for pretty much any matchup that you really want to. It's really just how you divvy up those tech includes and make sure you're still keeping those high counts of ball search and discard for your Archeops and make sure the deck is working. I think we're sitting often around like 14 energy as well as looking like a pretty healthy amount of specials to keep pulling out of the deck. Um, I believe the most popular build going into LAIC is more likely to be the Aurora build, uh, where Charizard and Uveltal will definitely be in there. I think those are the most important and strongest two cards, but then there could be some lightning tech. There could be some, you know, like ice Q wash water combinations, which is good against Reggie's and uh, sometimes good against Lost Zone Box as well. Um, there's going to be all these other things like Amazing Rare Raikou. There's going to be maybe even some other lightning type stuff going in like Zera Aura. Could even see some uh, Crobat VMAX. We've seen that in Japan because it can be helpful into Mew. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to see what happens with the Aurora build because we know that if any of them make top eight, that's going to be the go-to list from then on. Uh, but I do think there's going to be some mirror teched Aurora base builds and some sort of like just keep it simple Aurora builds, which has always been more so my style. But I do think uh, making the most out of your tech includes is going to be really important if you can predict the meta correctly. As for the colorless build, I think it's pretty important to play either Slacking or Gigas. Gigas is the one that's seen much more play online, uh, and possibly even Stoutland as well. I think Stoutland is actually pretty strong into Lost Box uh, and Giratina. And I actually think also the Aurora build, obviously you're playing powerfuls in both, can also benefit from a Stoutland. So these are cards that have been coming in and out of the list. Uh, I still preach that you just want to be as simplistic as possible because you are still a combo deck. Whiffing your Archeops is still the worst thing in the world. Uh, making sure you're not too vulnerable to Path of the Peak. Uh, even though there's not much Marley Path going around, uh, it could still find its way into a number of decks. Uh, we know that Reggie's plays a high path count. The Zard build of Lost Spots can play high path. Even some Muse may be getting creative and playing paths these days. So you will have to respect it and play not just your Pumpkin, but also probably some counter stadiums if at least you're the Aurora build. Um, I think there could easily be some Vacuums and Jammers coming in if you're respecting Duraladon and that sort of stuff. Jammer has other benefits, you know, protecting yourself against Regis and such. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a very, very strong deck. And with the ridiculous energy acceleration that Archeops provides, any random counter deck that comes out, we can react to in the format as Lugia. If we start seeing some random control energy destruction deck, you throw in a Blissey and you start to feel good about it. If you start seeing all these other archetypes come on in, even things like Galarian Weezing, you can just increase your DTE count and then magnet attach your way to a V star and hit through them that sort of thing so lugia has the chops and has the acceleration to deal with any random counter deck in the format so it's definitely an s tier deck in in the game right now and it's good enough into the other top decks in the game with the correct teching yeah uh let's finish out a tier with lost zone box um lost zone box still is again in our opinion a really really strong deck i think uh this and Giratina, I think we've kind of decided, are pretty interchangeable as the third and fourth best decks. Um, I think Giratina is probably a bit of a better pick up and play deck, but if you've got experience, especially um, in the uh, Lost Origin meta with Lost Zone Box, I don't think there's any reason to necessarily switch off now. We've seen a really wide variety of different uh, successful lists, and I think that's the biggest uh, point of intrigue for me at the moment is... Um, is this going to carry on? Are we going to continue to see all of these different wacky Lost Zone Box lists? It felt like over the past three or four days, um, there's been, you know, six, like four or five successful different takes on the deck, whether it's just regular um, sort of Sable, Sable like Charizard, whether it's uh, Mirage Gate with Greninja, whether it's Mirage Gate with uh, other stuff. You've got the uh, Kyogre, you've got Amazing Bear Raikou that's very popular in Japan that I think will uh, translate over hi here in some capacity. Um, so I think the two biggest points of interest are just whether we will get a definitive, uh, this is the best, at least probably Mirage Gate build and then uh, Sable Zard build will just always be around as a uh, very standard sort of cookie cutter Lost Zone box. Um, but determining whether there is a 
standard uh, Lost Zone box Mirage Gate build will be really interesting to see. Um, I think there's, I think the biggest merit of the deck at the moment is actually uh, be not your opponent not being able to play around everything that you could be playing. You realistically act as almost the exact same deck until you pull off your crazy turn, if, especially if you can um, hide these energies pretty well, which sometimes you can't with things like Confey and stuff. But if you're able to um, hide a couple of energies here and there, you can uh, sort of throw a Raikou out and all of a sudden be um, doing something like that or a Kyogre out all in one turn, which is pretty crazy. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the biggest things that uh, people have to deal with in trying to work out how do I play around or what am I what should I be playing around here? Um, the, the biggest uh, sort of crutch for me is uh, the fact that a lot of these Mirage Gate builds basically are built around some kind of bench damage. Um, and because of that, I think Manaphy is a very, very strong play for the weekend coming up um, in decks that naturally would play Manaphy anyway. Because um, I think it, I think if it's on your list of potential techs, I think it probably should be in because uh, it. I feel like all of these Mirage Gate builds are very much built around doing something crazy with the opponent's bench. Um, and a lot of the time, a Manaphy will at least stop that. And in certain instances in Lugia, say, uh, being able to wash up a Manaphy, uh, a Manaphy or an Ice Cube or something like that um, can really just lock down a Lost Zone box. So there are definitely things that you can tech in to try and deal with them. But I think the biggest thing is trying to deal with all of them. And it's going to be really, really difficult to um, do that. I'm not convinced on whether these Mirage Gate builds are actually better than the Sablezard build or whether this is just people being creative because it's the first couple of weeks. And, um, you know, some of these uh, Mirage Gate attacks are really, really strong in the format when gone, when they go unchecked. I feel like in the next two or three weeks, we could very much see um lost zone box just going back to being uh saber lion charizard and that being lost zone box and being a bit less flexible but uh being a bit more consistent say uh but yeah it's definitely still really honestly a really strong deck i think um again you're going to be probably feeling uh, a bit worried about picking it up this close to the tournament but if you've had some experience with it um, and you're comfortable with the Lost Zone engine, still think it's really, really strong. And uh, right now is probably the time to uh, whip out some crazy techs for um, these kinds of decks. Because honestly, um, no one's going to know what to play around. And realistically, that probably is going to mean they might be playing around the wrong thing. So uh, if you want to play a crazy Lost Zone box list, this, is, this weekend is probably the weekend to do it. It's so weird that we preached the sort of gate thing as most content creators had as soon as it came out. And... It was kind of overshadowed by Charizard, and a lot of these lists that have been doing well recently have don't even play many new cards, uh, but no. they're just seeing success again. So maybe somewhat of the format warping, but also just uh, people willing to risk stuff and it paying off in these online tournaments. I'd like to see more of it uh, IRL as well. Yeah. I'm going to play a sad violin for uh, Zorro Box. Mm -hmm. uh, I really love the new upgrades that it got, and it's a much better deck in a vacuum, but... We've just put Giratina and Lost Box uh, in our top five decks. So we've got to shunt Zoro all the way down to D tier <laughs> because it's basically Reggie's in that it works about a similar amount of times as Reggie's will, but you also have to dodge matchups. Whereas Reggie's is like, the matchups are there if you want a platter, you just need the deck to work. Whereas Zoro has to work enough times and also dodge and weave. And that's just too many things to do for Zoro, unfortunately. Um, so we are going to have to drop it low. Still going to be a pet deck that I love playing. And if for some reason uh, wacky decks come out that can punish the Lost Zone engine and there's a reason to play Zoro, I'm so ready to do it. Uh, but there's just no easy way that you can tech out your deck to deal with any Lost Box shenanigans. Uh, the Sableye is just too much of an easy solution. And similarly, the other Zoroark deck, Hisuian Zoroark, going to drop down in D tier as well. Um, realistically, this is the opposite uh, of a good matchup thread. We had a look at the matchups for this earlier on, and it turns out the best matchup it has is actually the 50 50 mirror, other than uh, Kirim, I think, which was the other one that was slightly above 50 50, which is just kind of sad. It's just not able to deal with um, a lot of things. I think Mew is also actually slightly favorable as well. But um, other than that, like it's never had a good time into. Um, things like Reggie's and stuff and some one prize decks. It's always been a deck that wants to uptrade uh, into two prizes. But with all of the special energy hate that is starting to creep into the format because of Lugia, all of a sudden that's the, you're getting caught in the crossfire. 
because of that. Um, it's also pretty easier for Lugia to out tank you with now V Guard energy as a thing. Um, Hisuian Zoro had was really walking a tightrope in terms of its damage output that it got away with in the last format, I think. But with V Guard energy coming out, it just doesn't get away with it anymore. Um, so yeah, there's really not many merits to playing uh, Hisuian Zoro anymore. It's very much gone from, uh, it was never like the strongest deck in the format, but it was definitely, I think, a pretty justifiable play, um, especially if it, you, you were just going for points. It was it was a pretty justifiable points play, I think. Um, but now it's, uh, I think, been relegated back to the binder, uh, realistically, just because it's caught in too many crossfires. Yeah, basically any strength of Zoroark you could be doing with Lugia now instead. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a real problem. Speaking of special energy hates, there has been a bit of a resurgence in popularity of Arceus Gerardon. We're going to pop it in B tier. We think it's strong enough against Lost Zone Box and Reggie's to stabilize itself in here. Um, it does still suffer at the hands of Mew quite often and really does not enjoy seeing Meloetta coming back in a big way uh, because you have very vulnerable openings and Mew is one of the best at capitalizing on that. Um, and it's surprisingly weak into Lugia. I think it's mildly positive from the online data we've seen so far. Uh, naturally, of course, the Aurora-based build uh, of Lugia will be playing Yveltal, and that's usually a once-a-game kind of deal. But the issue is, if they've knocked out an Arceus immediately with a powered-up Lugia with a ton of powerfuls, you only really have one Duraludon in play. So as long as they have tool removal at the right time for your Yveltal to come and take that knockout and get rid of Parasol... Uh, it means that there's not another Duraludon for them to have to go through. So uh, that's a big issue for you. They will be playing at least one tool removal. I imagine one Jammer is the most staple card. There could be two copies or there could be one and one vacuum. These are the things that I'm playing around with. But I think it's a, uh, a sure thing in the Aurora build. It makes too much sense to not have an answer to Parasol. And if it's the colorless build, they naturally will be playing either Gigas or Slacking or some higher damage output threats and a number of paths. So you're surprisingly weak into Lugia. You have to sort of make them have it in time scenario where you're putting pressure on with your Dura here and there and you're, you know, being that problem until they can get to the um, Yveltal swing turn, the Amazing Rare. So you, you're at least keeping them honest and making them draw through their deck. But as long as Lugia hits the answers it's actually pretty okay so weirdly enough Arctura sort of came back in the format because people were like oh this can deal with an all special energy deck but no it's actually here dealing with the lost boxes and the reggies <laughs> and the other stuff in the format that's actually keeping it afloat i'm still super sus of the deck and if mu is going to be as popular as i'm expecting i think it's actually a really bad meta call um but you've got to respect the stats that it's churning out and it at least has Starbirth at its side to get into the game. I think a lot of people are putting more consistency in Dura as well uh, in recent results. There's a lot of Tower of Darkness coming in. There's a lot of Trekking Shoes and other early game cards coming into the list, which is at least some peace of mind to get into the game. Uh, I'm also a big believer in Collapse. It's like a two count of stadiums in your list because, again, Reggies can play Path, so secure that matchup by playing Collapsed and make them have bounces and their next Reggie and their belt and all this other stuff. So uh, force more out of stuff. Uh, it's low-key helpful against uh, Mew and stuff as well, where you can deny a little bit of Genesect draw. Uh, so that's how I like playing Arctura. I was playing it just uh, for a video yesterday. Still had a torrid time. It's still a deck that draws badly, but it just kind of lands in the right metagame placement, I think, right now. Yeah. Um, the other Arceus variants, we've kind of lumped together for now. We're going to also put them in B tier. Um, I think this is something that is understandable. The more I think about this, um, the more I understand why we're putting it down here and why the, the, the results are saying that it's down here. Um, Arceus is a super reactive archetype, I feel, and it really depends on how the meta shapes to what you pair with Arceus. I think uh, this is kind of representing Arceus, Barrel, Marni, Path, but... There's still like 20% of your deck there, maybe like 30% 30, 30 of your deck there that is then dedicated to whatever you need to tech around. And right now, people are playing so much like random different stuff and uh, there isn't a defined better game that realistic, realistically Arceus just hasn't been able to perform yet. Um, I think throughout the format, this might not make it back to A tier, but it'll creep its way back up to B tier at the top of B tier once there is a definitive format for Arceus to build around and tech towards. Um... But right now, there's there's so much sort of uh, variety that I think Arceus is just a difficult um, sort of deck to pin down at the moment. There's no clear-cut way of what you need to be adding in or 
what you need to be teching for or anything like that. And because of that, I think it's kind of suffering. I think it's down at the bottom of B tier realistically. Um, and it's going to stay there until we know exactly how we need to build the deck. Um, Marnie Path is very, very strong against Lugia if you're able to uh, go second and lock in a path. Um, to, or if you're able to lock in a path going in, going uh, first or second, I guess, because you get to Marnie them before they get their Lugia turn. So um, I think that is something that will buy you advantage in the uh, Lugia matchup. It's just about working out how to best abuse that advantage, whether that's uh, through flying Pikachu, because it also has it has weakness, but it also has other um, sort of avenues that you're able, or, or other additional benefits against things like Lost Box and Regis, or whether that's uh, with Giratinas trying to uh, just KO the Lugias because they weren't able to accelerate out their V guards. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but right now, I think it's just all a bit up in the air as to exactly uh, what needs to be paired with Arceus, which makes complete sense. We always say this. I feel like we say this at, a lot, at the start of a lot of formats. Arceus really takes a hit in this format. But then by the end of the format, by the last couple of tournaments, Arceus always really comes back um, and proves us wrong. And it's a very, very solid deck again. And that's because it knows what it needs to include. So um, don't worry too much if you're an Arceus fan. I still think there's definitely merit, merits to the deck. I think you've probably just got to bide your time and wait um, at least until LAIC, but realistically maybe until the uh, trio of tournaments the weekend after as well to be able to get Arceus back out of the binder and uh, have a better time at a regional. I still think there's definitely room for Arceus, but just right now in this exact uh, in this exact early period of the metagame, there's too much random stuff going on for you to realistically be dodging and weaving and having the right techs here and there. When you know uh, your techs are going to be hitting sort of you know, a, a decent chunk of the field, six or seven rounds of the field, they're going to be uh, somewhat useful in, and you're actually able to then make use of a good list you've got. I think Arceus will definitely be back at the top of TV, maybe even pushing into tier A if it really can hone in exactly what it needs to be playing. Yep. Uh, it's something that I'm still toying around with. I still think there's a ton of merit, but like you say, cherry picking the right stuff and getting value from them is the name of the game, and sometimes you've got to be reactive with that. Let's look at uh, Vika Vault Regialeki. I'm kind of surprised by its matchup data. It's honestly not too different to what it was before we actually had Regialeki <laughs> VMAX, which is quite sad to say. It's surprisingly weak into Lugia variants, um, despite your type coverage because thanks to powerful colorless they have such good push potential in your vika vault anyway that you really need to have a ton of aleckis into play to be making the most out of your um item lock whilst also taking advantage of your weakness so really you almost go without item lock in the matchup and obviously they can also get don sparse down and then they're the one basically in complete control of that matchup and you're putting so many multi prizes down it's actually a big problem for you uh the one thing you're sort of stronger into is the Tina and Lost Zone box. Uh, but that was the case before as well. So I low-key think that if you're going to play Vikavolt this weekend, actually taking out Reggie Alecki might actually be the right move. And you just go back towards 2-1 uh, Drapion V-Star line. Drapion punishing Lugia for not playing switch outs uh, and also being really good into Mew. We're going to drop this into C tier, but I actually am still interested in Vikavolt. One of the bigger issues of Vika is that Arceus decks used to really prey on that. And we're saying that it's going to be a lot less prevalent. Like, Duraladon's probably going to be popular. I'd expect to see one in day one Swiss, maybe. Um, but again, even having the Drapion is helpful into these Arc matchups. Much more helpful than a Regialeki, I would think. Uh, because pushing from 110 to 50 doesn't matter into Arc at all too much. So, yeah, I'm really interested in how Vikavolt shapes up. It's one of the main punishers of the Lost Zone engine, and we're really lacking anything that can punish this engine right now, uh, outside of, like, Sableye <laughs> sprinkling them, which is just mirror text, basically. Uh, so I want to see more experimentation with Vikavolt. I think there's a place for it in the meta, certainly. Uh, but I low-key think that the Aleki might be the biggest bait of the whole list, and going back to other things could actually be the way to go uh, going forwards. Yeah. Um, Palkia Inteleon is something that we're also going to drop into B tier. Uh, this is another one where the stats have really, uh, really puzzled us a little bit, to be honest, because right now it's not performing great in terms of finishes and top eights. Um, but looking at the like matchup spread, it's still got a really solid amount of uh, good matchups out there. I think realistically, um, this is just online. Uh, tournaments kind of skewing the data a little bit. I think people probably one are um, a bit bored of Palkia and Teleon and like 
not necessarily playing it as much as they would be uh, or as it would be in a tournament. I feel like this kind of happened um, quite similarly with the Lost Origin meta. It felt like it felt like for a couple of weeks, Palkia and Talion was, uh, you know, people were saying it was dead and it was gone and it wasn't going to come back. And realistically, it was still there. It's just people weren't really representing it in online tournaments because they were playing the fancy new stuff instead. So I think in IRL tournaments, people will be picking up this deck um, still. It's definitely got a bit weaker. I think its Lugia matchup is um, a bit sketchy, to be honest, uh, or it can be a bit sketchy. Um, it's slightly favoured according to the stats, but I think Lugia can, uh, if they're able to keep a like a four, um, a, like like a four Pokemon bench with V Guard energy, they actually can prove to be a little bit difficult to uh, tear through. While they won't have too much of an issue taking down Palkias, so uh, it's probably the onus is probably a bit more on the Lugia player to play conservatively than the Palkia player to necessarily go aggressive. Um, and because of that, maybe you need to sort of factor that in when you're uh, adding the final couple of cards. Maybe you need an additional uh, couple of ways of dealing extra damage here and there. But I think you can deal with, um, yeah, you know, Lugia. Uh, I think Mew has always been a bit of a weird one. The Lost Zone Box is the weirdest one uh, for us. It's it's like the the stats on the Lost Zone Box. I think this is, again, uh, purely because Lost Zone Box is seeing a lot of play right now, but... Uh, Lost Zone Box into Palkia is doing is doing very like the the stats coming out are very different to what they were in the Lost Origin meta, which is bizarre because realistically both of these decks don't really play anything new um, in terms of like new cards or anything. It could just be that again, like Joe said, more people are being more creative with Lost Zone Boxes and therefore maybe have stronger answers that are in that are also uh, into Palkia Intel because they're playing Lightning answers into Lugia and stuff. So that could definitely be a factor and one that um, I think. Again, probably or more than likely actually won't translate over to the IRL meta. So one, I think that will make Palkia and Teleon a bit more favoured than the stats are showing into Lost Zone Box anyway. Um, but two, yeah, I just think the deck's representation is nowhere near what it will be in actual IRL tournaments. Um, I don't know whether it will necessarily be super popular at um, LAIC, but I think going into the regionals just after, it's still going to be uh, one of the more popular decks in the room, um, probably more popular than Arceus Duraludon. I would imagine by then Arceus will have started to find its feet, so maybe not. But I still think it will be like the sixth or seventh most popular deck, maybe even pushing into fifth if people aren't respecting Lost Zone Box or whatever. It could still be up there because it's, I feel like a lot of people are pretty diehard on it. And realistically, um, because we've said, you know, Vikavolt isn't actually as strong as it may seem, and um, there's still plenty of ways to deal with. Um, you know, everything that the format has been dealing with, or that the deck has been dealing with before. Lugia is the only real new uh, matchup that you have to kind of think about. And like I say, I think that is actually um, statistically slightly favoured, and with the right techs, or just playing uh, the Lugia player not playing super conservatively, can definitely play into your hands, and all of a sudden you're able to claw back games uh, from Palkia. So yeah, I think it's not being represented, like, necessarily properly at the moment, which is kind of weird, because... Um, I think it's still pretty strong, uh, but I think going into uh, some of these IRL tournaments, it will start to pick up a bit more um, traction, especially going into the uh, online tournaments afterwards, because uh, I think it will do a bit better than what the stats are currently showing for it. The other Melanie deck is also taking a bit of a backseat, a bit of a fall from grace from where it was. In the Lost Origin meta, I think it's just difficult to be a VMAX in this format. I think Mew gets away with it because it's crazy. Uh, but Kieran Malk doesn't have the same uh, attributes that Mew has. It's quite weak into Lugia because you give them such an easy map. Um, you also don't really appreciate just more Reggie seeing play, more Lost Box seeing play. Uh, so, And also you don't appreciate the aggressiveness of a Mew now. Uh, this was always a deck that enjoyed the fact that the format mostly didn't do much on turn one outside of Lost Box hitting 110 because uh, you could sit there with your Kiram and use your early attack just to get energies onto the board and then you're representing knockouts onto V-Stars um, and the format kind of going away from that a little bit and Lugia having that early tempo available with one prize Pokemon with... Again, the Gigas in the Colorless build, or uh, Yveltal and Zard and all this other stuff. Uh, possibly even Lightning Techs again, uh, at least dealing with the Palkia of V-Star and making it look a lot less bulky. These are all bad things for the Kiram Palk. Uh, I do think there's merit to Wash Water Energy and uh, Ice Q still. Uh, these still could be holding on that little bit. I know Giratina is going to be playing uh, Sinnoh's. Maybe Lost Box plays Sinnoh as well. I know there's been some people tinkering, uh, tinkering around with um, Sinnoh and Lost Box, but I still think that Path is probably the best in the Charizard build. It really depends on 
these other gate builds. Um, but I, I think there may be still some hope for Kieran Palkia. Definitely still a deck in the format. But uh, its matchup spread again seems to be getting that little bit weaker. It used to just be able to get on and do its thing. Uh, but I think there's too many decks sort of pressurizing you these days to actually build up your board as well as you'd like. Yeah. And finally, we're going to talk about Crow Crowbat Weezing more than anything, just because um, I feel like it's a bit of a fan favorite deck, but we're going to put it down in D tier. Realistically, the matchup spread is actually just not there. There's um, <laughs> The stats are actually okay for it, but that's just because no one's really actually trusting it enough to go into tournaments. And even into some of the matchups you want to be trying to beat, it's still not strong enough. It's um, a, a fun little uh, sort of one prize deck, I think, or a fun little one prize beta here and there. Like, uh, according to the stats, it's got a great Reggie and a great Lost Zone box, and basically everything else is trash, um, which is kind of the <laughs> the sort of the, the best way uh, of putting it, I think, is realistically you you farm a couple of fringe decks more than more often than not. But even something like it, according like look just looking at the stats, even when you've got all of this. All these different types of ability lock, Luke, you're still able to farm you just because you do, you genuinely do nothing during the games. It doesn't matter that they don't have abilities. They're able to manually attach to a Lugia and you're still only doing like 40 a turn or whatever. So, um, you know, realistically, it's, I think, a bit of a fan favorite. I'm sure if we hadn't put it on, people would have been like, oh, isn't Crow about wheezing um, something that's been doing well or whatever? But realistically, it's actually still, no, <laughs> it's still down there with the Zoros. It's not uh, as. Uh, sort of favourable into some of the matchups it may seem logically quite favourable into. So yeah, don't get baited. It's still still not the time and probably it still won't be the time for uh, until Weezing rotates. Yeah, so that wraps up our tier list. I think the only other thing worth noting is going to be some iteration of control. I actually really respect control in this format. I think there are a lot of reasons to try and capitalise on at least Lugia and how it accelerates its energy. I know there's a lot of talk about celebrating Z Veltol and, and maybe even like block Snorlax and a few other ways you can try and capitalise on Lugia. So that's the only thing that we haven't really like labelled, but also, you know, it's not seeing any success in online tournaments. But we know that in IRL events, uh, they can come out to play and it would be something that I'd at least give some consideration to with my deck choice. Um, but outside of that, um, it's, you know, shaping up pretty quickly this format uh, there's just going to be an ongoing question mark around what techs go in lugia as it remains the top contender uh, because basically you can cherry pick your techs based on how people are trying to target you i think for the most part so the lugias are always going to have to be reacting and not just keep with the same 60 which is going to be interesting to follow um but yeah it's uh, a ton of developments new to experiment with uh, lots of lost zone box to experiment with so even though we're only getting one new deck because it jumps straight to the top of that tier list, it really shuffles around the pack quite well and really does uh, make things feel pretty different. So, Jack, we're not going to LAIC, but we are both preparing for Stuttgart, which is the week yes. after. Um, first of all, what are the decks that you're going to be putting a good amount of time into? Maybe things you haven't had time to test just yet. Uh, mm -hmm. And secondly, what do you think are going to be the two most popular decks in top eight of, of LAIC? Uh, okay, so I'll do I'll do that second question first. I think Lugia realistically will probably be um, one of the most popular decks. I think it's uh, just too strong to not be. And typically, we do see in these formats uh, when a deck is seemingly S tier in that first tournament because people haven't worked out exactly what what lists people are going to be bringing to IRL tournaments. It usually just farms. So I'm pretty sure Lugia is going to be. Um, I would say potentially even up to like up to like 50% of the top eight. It wouldn't surprise me massively uh, if it was something like that, which is pretty crazy, um, but we could see something like that. Second most popular, I think the Mew Genesects will probably do well converting, but may not make it all the way um, there. I think it's probably going to be one of the Lost Zone decks. I want to say Giratina just because I think it's going to be more represented. Uh, I think uh, Lost Zone Box is probably a slightly stronger deck in um, a capable pair of hands, but I think... With, I think Giratina will still be, as we've seen through the whole of the Lost Origin format, will be far more popular. And because of that, we'll um, probably see uh, it, it's through to the second most popular top eight. So I'm going to say something like three Lugias, two Tinas, and then three other decks, maybe like a Mew, a Regis, and a Palkia or something um, for, the, for the top eight. I think if I were going, or at least what I'm going to be testing uh, in the meantime whilst watching the stream... Um, Lost Zone, I think, still is really interesting. I think 
trying to uh, nail down a good Mirage Gate list could be really, really strong, um, but could just keep, could just keeping it simple with uh, the original Sablezard build still seems very, very uh, reasonable. Um, I don't currently have access to Lugia's, but I'll probably be testing a bit of Lugia as well, just because um, the deck still seems very, very strong. And I think given that uh, Stuttgart is and Toronto and Brisbane actually are all only one week after LAIC, you're probably just about still in that little period of being able to coast off the back of Lugia being an S-tier deck. Realistically, people may not have the ability to work out what the best answer is in between um, LAIC and those tournaments. So you may still be able to just sort of hop into that bubble and try and coast your way there. Um, still be early enough in the format to do that. So I think I will probably end up be buy it will end up buying some Lugias this week and be testing Lost Zone Box on the side. Sounds really good. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree entirely with the top eight you lined out. I can't really question any of that. Uh, I'll be putting time into Lugia as well. Uh, uh, but I also really want to try out this next gen Zoro garb. I'm really enticed by the yeah. idea because we've both enjoyed playing you. I've recently uh, enjoyed playing Marnie Path in Arceus, and it seems like as Arceus is taking a bit of a bath right now, it's uh, time to incorporate that strategy into another deck. So yeah, that's our thoughts on the LAIC. Uh, later on this week as well, I'm going to have uh, top 10 decks with deck lists to discuss as well. So you'll see where our heads are at with the most refined, most up-to-date, uh, correctly teched out lists, ideally, uh, for the tournament. So yeah, stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll be back tomorrow for another one. Cheers.